I can attend any church I want to. I can listen to anything I want to. I can choose any candidate I believe in. I can say anything that's on my heart. I can express conflicts I have with the ruling power. I can start a business. Sell a product. And live a dream. These are all freedoms I enjoy. I engage in these freedoms and I appreciate them. But the only reason I have this quality of freedom, the only reason I have the freedom to do any of these things, is because of this. This is because of this. The price of freedom is great. And today, we remember that price. Today, we honor people who have gone to their graves in defense, in defense of our freedom. Greater love has no man than this. Then he lay down his very life. For a friend. Morning. I'm Carol Chandler, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to worship this morning. We're blessed to be worshiping with you, whether you are present in the sanctuary or online with us. And we hope that you will find uh, blessings in today's service. There's just a few things that I want to bring to your attention as we begin. At this time, please register your attendance through the Church Center app. And while you have your cell phones up to check in, please make sure your phone is on silence mode. Those of you worshiping with us in person have an order of worship with a designated space to complete your attendance information if you would rather connect with the church office in that way. Please fill out the perforated portion on the back page, tear to separate, and leave it in your seat after worship. If you're a visitor with us this morning, you can take the sheet to the back welcome table following the service to receive a gift from us this morning. As we approach colder weather and we'll spend more time in enclosed spaces, please be aware that the balcony is set up to encourage social distancing. If you desire to be more intentional about social distancing, we encourage you to sit in the rear balcony as every other pew there is closed off at this time. If you have prayer requests, you can share those through the Church Center app the QR code, or the paper prayer cards that are in the pews that you can complete at this time and place in the plates when the offering is collected later in the service. If you're worshiping from home and would like to see the order of worship for this morning's worship, please follow the QR code on the screen at this time to access the service order. During the offering time today, we will pass the offering plates for folks that prefer to give in this way. 
On the screens are the online ways in which you can also give to support the various ministries of the church if online giving is your preferred means of giving. At this time, please turn your attention to the screens for this week's video announcements. Hi, this is Kevin Mabry inviting you to the Kevin Mabry Family and Friends Christmas Concert to be held in the Burnside Family Life Center on Sunday, December the 12th at 7 o'clock p.m. We'll be featuring my daughters, my granddaughters, and special musicians coming into play. This is always a big event, so we ask you to come early, and that's at the Burnside Family Life Center on December the 12th at 7 o'clock p.m. We are going to be featuring different Christmas songs and songs that will reflect Christ's birth. We just hope you will come. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, hello, church family. It's Pastor Mark here. We want to tell you about our Christmas poinsettias that our youth ministry sells uh, each year. Um, these poinsettias decorate both the traditional and contemporary worship spaces all the way up to the Christmas Eve service, and they're yours to take home after that. Registration for getting your poinsettias would be before December 15th. So please make sure you go to either our church website or our app. Look under that Christmas tab. You will find all of the information there. It's also in the weekly update and the celebration of season flyer that is out now that has lots of different ways that you can give and participate in this season coming up. Thank you guys so much. Hello friends, the Thanksgiving service is not Wednesday, but Sunday night, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So Sunday, the 21st of November, 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. It's a combined service with people from all over the place, different churches, various clergy all together. What a wonderful way to celebrate Thanksgiving, the Sunday night before Thanksgiving. If you want to participate in the food drive, grab one of these bags, follow the instructions, Put the heavy stuff on the bottom, fluffy stuff on the top. You can bring the bags into the church on any Sunday before that, including that Sunday morning on the 21st. If you have to bring it in that evening, that's fine. But if we need to repack things, it's nice to have it just a little bit ahead of time because right after that service, we take the food to the food pantry. Look forward to seeing you that night. Hey, church family, this is Michael George. I wanna let you know that we're putting together military care packages right now that are gonna be going out to the soldiers and sailors and airmen uh, all across the country and all across the world uh, that are members of our church family. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to uh, review the weekly update that was sent out uh, by the church for a list of items that could be used um, for these packages. I remember when I was in the Navy um, serving um, in Virginia and, uh, and then, then uh, over here in Japan, um, receiving those care packages was always really special. It was a little taste of home um, uh, and uh, was really uh, motivating and heartwarming and uh, God really reached to me knowing that uh, there were people that were praying for me and that uh, remembered and cared about me. So. Uh, if you can, that'd be an awesome way to uh, contribute uh, to God's kingdom and to this church family. Uh, so thanks a lot. Really appreciate that support. Please bow with me now for the morning opening prayer. Lord, we gather in your presence to praise you for your wisdom, justice, and might. We see the manifestations of your power even in the aching, fragile places of our lives. We've come to meditate on your faithful love. Please be with us now in this time and place. In the name of Jesus, giver of grace, we pray. Amen. Continue to prepare your hearts for worship as Linda Forey shares this morning's prelude.
I invite you to stand now as you are able for our opening hymn, number 98, To God Be the Glory. Join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
as we continue worship with our prayer of confession, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. Merciful God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You give us our talents, our freedom, and our financial resources. We struggle to give back to you from these gifts. We often worry that these gifts are not enough, that we must hold on to them for ourselves and for our family. Remind us again that you have blessed us to be a blessing to others and free us for more generous living. Forgive us, O oh God, for all our sins as we continue to pray in silence. And let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, uh, children may be uh, released to go to kick. Uh, there are folks in the back of the sanctuary waiting to greet you and take you to that activity. And Pastor Nathan is now going to share a stewardship moment with us. Our beloved friend and sister in Christ, Bonnie Rodenberger, was going to be the one today to talk about our Stewardship Sunday, which is next Sunday, but she is home not feeling well. So let's kind of look at the camera and wave at her, say, Bonnie, we love you, and, and uh, pray for you. And if you all right now, if you would just kind of take a minute to think about how she would have talked about this beloved church. And about this point, you would have laughed, because she's funny. Now wipe a, a tear from your eye, because it would have been moving. And uh, if you know her, she's, she's extraordinary. Now when you think about this church, sometimes we laugh, sometimes we cry, we do everything in between. And whether you're online or you're here in person, you benefit from the ministries here, and as do I. And so we're all called to, to respond in faith. If you're able, and if as, as you pray about it, you're willing to, to bring your pledge card in next week, we're going we're gonna to submit those together and pray together that, that God would help us to fulfill that kind of commitment. So if that's something you're led to do, if that's something you can do, next Sunday is, is Commitment Sunday. Uh, we've run into the, the wonderful blessings of technology, trying to mail out to all of our members and, and friends that give to the church uh, mailings. Um, some of you received some stuff probably yesterday. Some will receive it this coming week. It's been, been a, a, an interesting challenge. So if you don't receive one, or if you're new to the church and you say, hey, you probably don't have all my information, but I'd love to support the church, there are little stacks of, of the letters that, that I wrote and then the, the little pledge cards. There are stacks on the little table in the back there, the little table over here. And, uh, and if you're able to do that, it's an amazing thing. Um, one final thing about that. As we were putting together the mailing list, I realized that they were going out to some kids. And we were like, wait a second. We don't want to guilt kids into anything, which we don't. However, we realize that, that those are kids that have gone through confirmation. If you go through confirmation in the United Methodist Church, in this congregation, that means you have a vote on all things official, including if you want to show up for the business meeting, you get to vote on my salary every single year. How many, how many organizations allow a 12 or 13 year old to come in and vote for the salary of the leader of the organization? How many organizations have 12 and 13 year old girls come up here and preach to them and tell them about God? And this evening, my, uh, my 13 year old son said, I've got to be at Quake tonight because Tencent is preaching. One of our teenagers bringing the message originally from the other side of the world and uh, lives here now. So I love this church. I know you do as well. And so would you join with me in praying? And then we're going to receive our, our typical offering. And you may give online. You may give through text. You may give in this space. And folks online, who knows um, how you participate. But we just love this church. Let's pray together. 
Lord, here we laugh, here we cry, here we, we raise our kids, here sometimes we even pass away. And so at all stages of life, you are blessing this community through this local congregation. So what a privilege to participate in it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, all those things we talk about. We just pray that in this time of great uncertainty in the world, that you would help us to grow in our certainty of your goodness and your love for us. Help us to be saved by Jesus. Help us to be filled with the Spirit. And help us to make this church a wonderful place and a little slice of heaven on earth. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll participate. God, we praise you for you are above all. All things came into being because of you. You've revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to praise you with the rest of our time here together and ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us, lead us, guide us, and transform us more into your image. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And thank you for worshiping with us. You know, this is a a particularly meaningful week for many of us who have veterans in our family or who are veterans themselves. And I'm going to talk about uh, a theme kind of relating to this past week. But before I do, I wanted to make sure that we took an opportunity to gather together here and folks online to be able to, to honor the veterans that we have together. I'm going to read off the, the branches of the military. I'm going to do it in alphabetical order. And if you if you are a veteran in one of those branches, would you stand? And I'm going to end with the one that it's going to take me probably 10 years to get used to, Space Force, the official branch, you know, established and uh, increasingly into the years to come, we will have folks that will stand with that. And so I've got to make sure 
that I stay, uh, stay on that. So, friends that served in the Air Force, would you stand and then remain standing? And friends that have served in the Army, or are serving in the Army, would you please stand? My goodness. Coast Guard, would you please stand? Marines, would you please stand? Navy, would you please stand? And Space Force, would you stand? Friends, are you proud of and appreciate these individuals? Amen. Amen. Thank you. 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 You may be seated, and uh, we we are honored, and we have a wonderful country in part because of such people, and you all treasure them. And I know you heard Michael George, one of our veterans, talking on the screen about collecting for veteran care packages we'll be sending. And that's something we do as a church. It's a powerful, powerful thing. As we think about uh, what we're living for, I, I feel a, a special burden to be a part of helping people to live out the freedom that, uh, that we have and in what way we should live it out. And I get deeply disturbed when I hear people say stuff like, um, gosh, our schools are really struggling and the kids in our schools are, are struggling and it's not like, like it used to be. And that, that bothers me deeply. And I try to figure out, okay, how can I be a part of the solution? I don't want to be a part of just, you know, those who complain. I want to be a part of the solution. And part of why I do what I do is I feel like, you know, the more that we follow the ways of Jesus and the more that we're saved through him, the better our country is. And then the better that the, the veterans that have served can look at our country and say, I'm proud of our country. So you all are a part of helping us to live out a fulfillment of what those folks sacrificed for. So as we think about freedom, uh, the, the author and pastor Tim Keller, some of you like his books and have watched some of his videos. Tim Keller, he's, he gave a talk at Oxford University that I watched on YouTube that was so powerful that I'm probably going to quote him and not even realize it. And I realize I better give him credit right up front. So Tim Keller, I'm sure you're watching. I'm sure you're a worshiper. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. We appreciate it very much. But as you think about the idea of freedom, you think, okay, so freedom is a complicated concept. What is it that we're trying to be free from? You think about that. What are we trying to be free from? From whom do we want to be free? Is there, is there a person or an entity or something like that that we're trying to be free from? Um, if you think about, you're free to do what? What is it that we're trying to be free to do? Um, Rolling Stone said, I'm free to do whatever I want. I bet I could sing this right now, and some of you would know it, wouldn't you? Uh-huh, yeah, some of you would. I'm free to do whatever I want. Wait a second. So this idea of freedom is something that right now in our country, we have the, just this incredible debate going on, and, um, and it's been going on for a long time in our country. We've been struggling with that for a long time. And I wanted to kind of dip my toe in that. And so let's just start off with just kind of a morally neutral thing that nobody has any opinions on. Let's start with gun control. Let's start with gun control. All right, now just, just stick with me. Regardless of your political position and stuff, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm from West Virginia. If you don't have a gun, I'm not sure you can live in West Virginia, right? You know, so originally, you know, and so I've been around guns my whole life and, you know, come from... Grandpa's military, all that kind of stuff, right? And Grandpa used to take his, his 22 rifle to school with him to hunt on the way home, right? That's how much stuff's changed, right? So let's think about this for a second. Um, is it wise and prudent to take a five-year-old and give them a loaded machine gun with the safety off? Is it wise and prudent? You know? No, no. I, I don't care what your position is politically on the idea of gun control. We all believe in some level of it. Like, that would be stupid. Don't do it. Are you free to do that? Could you go home today and, you know, five, five, find a five-year-old and give them that? You know, is, is it possible for you to do that? Yeah, it's possible. Is it wise? No. Should you do it? No. So freedom's a funny thing, right? Let me give you a couple of other examples. I love to drive fast. How many of you like to drive fast? Yeah, all right, yeah, it's like that. Um, I like that. Um, is, it, is it wise and prudent to take a five-year-old, put them behind the, the car that has already been turned on, and, you know, tell them, hey, you know, try to, try to operate this thing and drive as fast as you want, because it's fun, right? 
I mean, we're free, right? Do what you want. Do what you want. That would be stupid, right? Some of you are looking at me horrified. Those are two really bad examples. Well, I've got an even better one. Let's talk about sex. We're free to do whatever we want. I mean, man, yes, we're free. Yes, you know, man, you know, and ever since, you know, the 60s and onward, and, and it's been a human problem. It hasn't been just since then, has it? You know, it's just struggling, you know, wow, yeah, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, and I, you know, I just want to do whatever I want, you know. But even those that live out life that way, I've seen it again and again. If they fall in love with one particular person and they want to have kids with them, all of a sudden they're hoping for some level of restraint, right? I joke sometimes when people say that my kids look like me, I'm like, yeah, thank God, right? Just never, never know, you never, never know. I'll give my wife a hard time sometimes. It'll be fun in the next service when she's sitting there looking at me and, okay. You know, but all of a sudden you start worrying about, well, am I getting diseases? Am I not because of the freedom? Like all of a sudden, even So even if you're not from a Christian framework, there is a certain level of freedom you would want, but also you would accept the fact that there are certain limits on our freedom in certain situations that we we actually want, and they're actually healthy for us. The the, the confusion comes in when we're trying to figure out, well, then, then how do we make up our minds on what we ought to be free from and what we ought to be free to do and all of that. So we're trying to put all that together. I'm trying to make sense of that as well. And I realized in the in the intelligentsia, in the, in the, you know, the, the, the professors and in the, the media, the folks that are influencing culture, for a number of years, and this wasn't just in America, this, you see this in Europe and now we're seeing this worldwide, there were ideas that came forward that seemed really smart and good. So for instance, in Europe, and then we imported it into America, where they thought, well, if we've been fighting about religion and stuff and we can't seem to agree, what would be best is to take religion completely out of the picture and just raise up the individual. The individual, we want the individual to know that they can do what they want, and we're gonna protect the rights of the individual. And what we ended up doing then is we ended up saying, well, then the individual is God. We don't need an external God because that's oppressive and it's limiting and it's ridiculous to the point that some, some people would teach explicitly or implicitly that the only real sin in the world is to limit the rights of the individual. So it would be sinful then to think that there's a God imposing upon us rules or expectations that we, we would have to then limit our freedom. That's what's sinful. See how that works, right? So when the self then is God, you get this idea that you can do what you want, you make up your own rules. But we just saw that there are holes in that, that theory. Five-year-old given the machine gun, five-year-old given the keys to the car, or just do whatever you want sexually, you realize, wait a second, even if you're not a God-believing person, you realize, oh, shoot, there are problems with this idea that the individual knows best and is God and can do whatever they want. Doggone it, what do we do about this? And the Christians come along and say, hey, God's revealed to us a better way. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't feel right, and with secular society, you'll even be made fun of for thinking this. But there actually is this God who rules the universe because God's responsible for it. And as you start living out life that way, then you realize, wait a second, I can make wise decisions and wisely live out freedom. I can be wisely free, if you would, and live out life that way, and it's gonna be better. Let me give you an example, because Paul himself, a couple thousand years ago, wrote about that. Now, this whole idea of 20 weeks to live, we've been taking 20 weeks to read through the New Testament. You look at that and you say, 2,000 years ago, culture and people were so different, there's nothing in there that could apply to me. Could, is, there, is there possibly? Well, yeah, this idea of the individual kind of being God versus there's an external God that, that's revealing to us how to live, is something we've been struggling with as humans for a long time. That goes way, way, way back. You can even read about that in the beginning parts of Genesis, you know, trying to figure out Do I determine what's right, or does God determine what's right? So, as we're wrestling with this then, at least give it a chance. If you're not a Bible-following person, give it a chance. Let's look at some of what Paul writes to the Galatian Christians, okay? So these are folks in the Roman Empire. They're, They're trying to follow Jesus, trying to figure out what to do. And he says at one point, it is for freedom that Christ set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, Does that sound American or what? Right? It's like, yes. 
and I want to uphold that. Like, that's amazing. And Paul gave some of the seeds for freedoms later on that we in our country even took a while to figure out, and then we lived it out. And it's like, wow, yes, we're called to be free, free in Christ. He set us free from things. We're going to get into this from multiple different angles, and hopefully it's going to help. He says, okay, so you're free, you're set free by Jesus Christ, but, in verses 13 and 14, same chapter, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the whole entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that sure sounds Canadian, doesn't it? I mean, come on, you know, it's like, wait, what? Okay, so I'm free, yes, I'm set free, in order to then be able to overcome my own selfishness and my own self-centeredness and my own ego, to then be able to love others humbly. Because that's the whole summation of that whole Old Testament law. Amazing, it's really, really, really cool. So you think about this, what am I set free from? And Paul in Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, those four little books of the Bible that we're reading right now in our Bible reading plan, he gets at a lot of different ideas. You're set free from the slavery of sin, that, that we just can't help ourselves but sin. Every single one of us lied as a little kid, right? You didn't have to be taught to lie. Did you take the cookie? And probably all of us at some point were like, oh, no, I didn't take the cookie. Wouldn't be, right? You know, even the really, really good kids, they struggle, right? It's, you know, we all struggle. To, to, so we're set free from that so that you, you can say, hey, I, I don't have to be that way anymore. I had somebody say one time, it never occurred to me to try to be good. I just wasn't raised in an environment like that. We kind of lied to each other. We would, you know, manipulate. We would hide stuff and whatever. And as I started following Jesus, somebody said, well, you know, the, the idea once you're saved is to try to be good. And it was like, I never had thought about that. True story. Interesting. Some, so you're set free from that. You're set free from the condemnation of, of punishment and, and hell and, and just that whole, that whole punishment idea. You're set free from that. So now you can live a different life. You're set free from kind of the sensual enslavement. I've known people who, both men and women, who gave themselves up to so much of their sensual appetites, right? You know, I just, they just did what they wanted. They did what they wanted. They watched what they wanted. They looked at what they wanted. That it then became slavery for them. They couldn't help themselves. Have you known folks like that? Have you ever been in that situation? And, and it may be something sexual. It may be something material. You know, I just, I just couldn't help myself. I just kept buying this. Stuff. I just kept buying, you know, whatever. Or I always wanted the bigger house, bigger house, bigger house, whatever it may be. God, God through Jesus sets you free from that. So you don't have to live that way anymore. You're, you're you can live a different way. Now the issue then is growth. And how do you grow becoming more and more that, that kind of way of loving your neighbor as yourself? Let me give you some more just Bible passages and then we'll try to do some business kind of on our own self to try to, to live this out. He's like, you're free, but you're not to do whatever you want. Doggone it, I love the Rolling Stones. Okay, fine. Just understand that one song is not a good one to live by, right? It's like, wait a second. Now we've got to do what, what God's calling us to do. Back in 2 Corinthians, our, our reading of this past week, perhaps, says, where the Spirit is, there is freedom. Some of you have been set free from stuff. And it's, it's amazing. The freedom from, you know, the guilt and shame. Freedom from um, maybe the, the, the habits of your family or, or the, the way that you looked at yourself. And you're able then to step over into seeing yourself through God's eyes and seeing other people through God's eyes, that kind of stuff. So there is that freedom as the Spirit comes in. But what does it look like then to live it out? Well, let's go back into Galatians. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit. So as you're living in that freedom of the Spirit, when you're living free and you're, you're doing what God wants you to do, there are things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Isn't that wonderful? I've, I've, I've known people where they're like, I, I'm given more self-control. I had no idea I, I could... I could stop saying these hurtful things to my kids, and all of a sudden I'm starting to kind of rein that in and realize, okay, I, I can have more peace, I can have more joy, 
I'm not perfect. I'm still trying to grow, but you know, I may take a step back or two, but I'm, I can, as I rely on that spirit, it just helps me to live out life in this wisely free way. It's such a powerful idea that even in, in Galatians 5, you can find this particular passage where he says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You're like, wait a second, I was taught in the church, we got all these rules and we got all these regulations and I got I to gotta measure up and I got to do exactly whatever, you know, and all this stuff. And he's you know, like, no, 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 hold up. Okay, there are a lot of things to do, but there's one principle, <laughs> God's love. And so you love God, you love other people with that godly love. You, that's the only thing that's counting. And Paul looks at it from all these different angles, trying to put it all together. You don't just do what you want, you do what God wants. And then it's a beautiful expression of all these other beautiful things, okay? Let's hit Ephesians, and then let's do some kind of prayer together, all right? In him, we have redemption through his blood. This is, a, this is an interesting passage. Would you guys mind kind of reading this with me out loud and so folks online can I hear us all together? Let's read this out loud. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Through what Christ did. So when you're over here in sin and brokenness and shame and guilt, all that kind of stuff, or things start coming through in your life and you start realizing that's where I'm at. Christ's blood, his righteousness, it comes upon you, it's offered to you, you accept it, and you're able to be forgiven, and that kind of salvation kind of process starts that trusting in the Lord. And so now you're saved, you're adopted into God's family over here. You didn't earn it. It's God's grace. You weren't trying to do all the right things to be forgiven. You're just, you're accepting, you're trusting. And then he just kind of rounds out his ideas there saying, with all wisdom and understanding, (laughs) wisely free, right? With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. If you don't like the way it's put together, well, I don't know. Go create your own world and rule it. That's your prerogative. God creates us, and then he says, here's how the way it works. He's made known the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. Some of you are really into end-time stuff, right? We're in the end times, and technically that is true. Well, what is the end-time stuff? Well, in Ephesians, it's described in these words. He says, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That's what Christ was doing when he's revealing to us salvation in him, love in him, trying to bring us all together unified. Us, the whole world, unity under Christ. That's what we work for. That's what we we offer to people. Beautiful, beautiful union with God through Jesus by the power of that Holy Spirit coming upon us and in us. That's why I kind of keep, keep trying to look at this particular way of praying. The prayer doesn't save you. The faith and trust that you're offering to God in this state of sinfulness, as you trust in what Jesus has done for you, that's what saves you. As as that faith is being expressed, that's what saves you. But the prayer can help to orient you in that direction. Let's pray this together if if that still reflects what you think and believe. Let's pray this together. God, I need a Savior. I believe Jesus' death on the cross frees us from sin his resurrection from the dead empowers us for life after death. I trust Jesus as my Savior and leader now and forever. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Does the prayer save you? Yes or no? No. The faith behind the prayer, the trusting in Jesus is what saves you. If the prayer helps you to express that and connect, then that's what is saving you. But I'm going to have us pray that a lot, just to remind us to come back to that faith and trust. Then, from that that point of salvation, now we get to grow in our grace and our following Jesus and the the, the behavior that we do. As I was talking with some friends this this week about in the schools, man, you know, they're struggling and kids acting crazy and doing, doing crazy stuff. And we're trying to figure out how to discipline and how to do all these things. It started occurring to me. I'm like, well, wait a second. Like, if I'm a kid... And nobody has introduced me to anything that can help me in this kind of centered, self-centered, you know, selfish way of living. And nobody has shown me this external God that loves me and Jesus and the example of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. Nobody has ever shown me that, at least not legitimately. 
And then how do you expect me to overcome all of my sinful tendencies? How do you expect me to behave right? How do you expect me to forgive and act like all that stuff? You're, you're setting a bar of expectation that's over on this side of Christianity, which is I'm being saved, I'm being redeemed. Now I'm growing in, in Christ. That's why it's important that we try to raise our kids to, to love the Lord, to, to see us pray, to realize there's something beyond us, not just ourselves. You get a whole, whole, I mean, I have compassion sometimes for kids that act up, and I'm like, okay, that's not okay, but for, if I expect you to act over here, you don't have the resources to do it. In the prison system, when Kent Money walks into a prison, and he talks with a guy, and they're like, I have never seen a good family. <laughs> I've never had my dad say anything good, kind to me at all. And now you're, you're introducing me to a, a loving heavenly father. You know, like, what are you talking about? Okay, it doesn't excuse it. doesn't make it okay what they did. But you understand where they're coming from, right? They didn't have the resources. And then you try to give them the resources. And you say, oh, okay. Okay. Now I... Now, okay, I can start to control myself a little more. I can start to love my, my, my friends that are irritating me or the people that I disagree with. I can start to love them more. I can start to forgive more because I have the resources. I've got it. So I wanted to make sure that we hammer on that because otherwise when we get to stuff like Ephesians chapter 4, then you look at some of the expectations of Philippians or Colossians. You've got to make sure that you get that, the process right. Otherwise, you're expecting people to act in ways that they're not capable of acting. Does that make sense, or do I need to go back through that again? So are you with me? Does that make sense? Like, this is a big deal. So then, in Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, then, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So if you're not buying into Christ loving us, giving himself for us, dying for us, and that that's what you should do in life, it's going to be hard to live into that. But if you buy into that and you experience his love and grace and forgiveness, now the bar of loving people can go up. And Paul raises it really high. Among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Quick show of hands. This is going to be a brave one. How many of you are Christians? You, you understand the forgiveness of God, but at times there have been hints, all right? <laughs> hints of immorality, impurity, something not right, something not good. How many of you have had hints of that in your life? <gasps> you know, right? Yes, thank you for being bold enough to raise your hand. So Paul, then writing to Christians, he raises that bar, saying, wait. Now that you're experiencing the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, let's clean ourselves up and live the way that God's called us to live. Let's, let's at least try to hit reset and do that. So I started thinking about that, and I thought, okay, so let's, let's figure out if you're on this side of, of faith. You're having faith in the Lord. You're trying to follow him. The prayer that I put up there, you've gone from darkness to light. Okay, now what do I do? Well, think about in your own life, is there some kind of hint of impurity, or immorality, or greed, something like that. Is there a hint somewhere where you say, wait, sometimes I drive too fast, Nathan, <laughs> and so I need to slow down. I'm getting too many parking tickets. You know, okay, all right, that may sound silly, but, but, that, but that happens, right? Okay, so let's say that you turn that over to God, and you say, God, okay, I'm not going to hell for this, but it's, it's improper for me as a, as a Christ follower. I'm, I'm being too dangerous. So, God, forgive me of that. Give me the strength. And for the next week, I'm going to drive in the right-hand lane wherever I go. Try it. One week. Try it. Try it. See, see what the Lord does. All right? We're just getting practical, right? If there's something that you watch or that you look at, and it may be not some hardcore porn stuff or whatever, but you just realize, eh, my eyes and what I'm taking in, their attitudes or their message or those images, they just are a little too impure, not quite what God would want. I'm going to name that and say, okay, God, what I look at, I need to, I need to change what I look at. And maybe there's, there's a station you don't watch or listen to or, or there's, you know, something that you just, you take maybe a one day. <laughs> maybe you say, okay, I've been feeding myself this all the time. I'm going to take one day. God, with your power and strength, help me not to look at that or not to listen to that or whatever it is. Just for one day. 
And help me, God, to have an image in my mind of what it would be like to be set free from that. Just completely free. I don't have to look at that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. Does that make sense? Um, maybe you got, you know, the loaded guns at the house, and you're like, I'm free. I don't have to do anything. And on the way home today, you're going to say, you know, maybe, maybe I ought to buy a trigger lock. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Right? Put it on. I, I don't know. I don't know. I know, I know, I know. We're, we're free. But are there things that are those hints or those, those little things where Satan is jumping up and down saying, I got, I got you there. I got you. And you say, ah, no, you don't. I see what you're up to. And I'm going to come to the Lord. And I'm going to say, God, I want, I want to be set free from that also. I want to live a better life in that one way. You're going to name it. You're going to take a day or a week and do something that's going to correct it and ask God for help and a picture of what would it be like to be set free from that. That makes sense? Okay, cool. Let's have somebody on this side. What, what are you going to do? No, I'm not going to do that. But this side, all of a sudden, you started paying attention, right? It's like, whoa, tell me, tell me. Think about what that is. Okay, let me, let me start praying, okay? Okay, tomorrow we're, gonna, we're hitting reset. We're starting anew. We're starting fresh. We're going to live... We're going to live life even more free than we were when we woke up this morning. Even more free. Free in a wise way. Free in a way that gives the impression of love, the evidence of goodness and faithfulness and self-control out into the world. Set us free so that we can live free with great wisdom in Jesus' name. And God's people said together, Amen. 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 Would you stand together as we sing, and then we're going to join in together in some more prayer. God, give us kindness, self-control, and hearts and hands that share. Many of you have, have decided to give through Operation Christmas Child, and others are giving in other ways to, to particularly bless people around them this particular season. I want to take a moment and pray for the, the kids that are going to be receiving these. Okay? So they may go, I mean, any, any place all the way around the world. And some kid's going to look at this and, and eventually realize, wait, there is a stranger out there that thought that I was worth getting gifts for. Hmm, I wonder what motivated them. So let's pray together. God, these gifts that we are sending out around the world, 
I thank you for the friends here that have been moved by you to give in this way. I thank you for Kathy Smith, who has helped to coordinate this and just keeps it going, make sure they get to where they need to go. I thank you for our youth that help to, to put things together that need to be put together. And so, God, we pray that your spirit would go before the packages and that the kids that receive it, we pray that they would have a revelation from you, that they are worth your love. Help them to see that because of our love for them and raise them up to know you, your freedom offered in Jesus Christ, the power of your Holy Spirit. Just pray that this would be one of those little pieces of the puzzle that you're putting together in their life to bring them into a relationship with you. And God, may these also represent for us what we're going to do throughout this entire season of Thanksgiving and Christmas. Help us to be able to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others in such a way that they might know how much they are valued, how much you love them, and might get a glimpse of the freedom that you offer them in Jesus Christ. If you agree with that, would you say, thank you, Jesus? Thank Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Carol, would you bless us as we go forth? As we close our worship service, receive this benediction. Go now into the world, inspired by the extravagant love of God. Live generously with open hands. Love one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do. And may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you. And may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire and encourage you in every good deed and word. Amen.